Welcome to logic and memory design. This is a pretty central topic to everything uh, that we're going to kind of do in the coming weeks. Um, previously in the course, we've you know talked broadly about hardware and software, the relationships, the different types. Uh, we've talked about how we deal or how computers more specifically work with binary numbers. How you know this concept of a switch that we've talked about that we haven't dived deeply into yet, but we will. Um, you know represents information as um, a zero or a one, and then how we can build on top of that all the layers we need to represent everything from a boolean value, which is nothing more than a zero or one, uh, to a video. Right? Um, you know we learned about things like two's complement for numbers and ASCII and UTF um, and, and video encoding and all these things, right? So that was all ways that we can take the world and, and save it and manipulate it using this concept of a switch, but we haven't yet delved deeply into um, A, what that switch is, uh, and then kind of B, how do we you know, on the hardware side of things now, how do we build up this machine that is capable of doing all those things that we talked about, right? So that's where we start today. Uh, we start at the most kind of granular level that we're going to address, which is the transistor. So we're not going to get into the physics of it. We're not going to, um, other than a quick kind of introduction to um, transistors and doping and p-type and n-type and that kind of thing. We're not going to dive deeply into the physics of why all that stuff works. Um, that that is, is out of the scope of the class. Um, but we will discuss what a transistor is at a, as a, at a you know basic level so that we can build on top of it. And what we build on top of it are logic gates. So you might recall uh, your Boolean uh, algebra, right? You might recall things like AND and OR and NOT, um, maybe XOR. Uh, we're going to see now how we actually uh, perform those logical operations, which are the foundations of everything the computer does, using those transistors. So we'll, we'll kind of build up that first layer of abstraction. We'll start with the transistor as the core, uh, and then we're, we're going right to the center of the onion. And then the, the very first layer out is going to be um, our gates that we use the transistors to construct, and then we'll build more complex circuits out of multiple gates, things like ALUs and registers, and, and how do we store information in memory. Um, so that's that's how we're going to attack it. Um, kind of taking this for a moment before we go off the deep end and, and dive into the center of the onion, looking back at a high level conceptual view, um, this is what we're going to be constructing. We're going to be constructing um, a CPU uh, along with memory. The first part of this video uh, will be really concentrating on everything inside the CPU. Uh, the second part, we're going to dive into how you store things in memory. Um, so remember that we said that memory and the CPU go hand in hand. We need both of them in order to be able to uh, have a working computer system. Uh, because uh, we get our instructions from memory, right? We act on them, as we've seen in, in our little man computer and assembler. Um, and then we also, some of those instructions will actually go back to memory to uh, retrieve data or to save data, right? So um, both of these things, even though they're, they're separate hardware components, um, they work together. So we're going to be talking about them as such. We will first kind of jump into um, how we build up a CPU, and then we'll talk more about how we build up memory. And, you know, where we're coming from, just to kind of give a quick relation there, um, was this idea of this abstraction called Little Man Computer. We use this as a way to, um, you know, understand how a computer works at its most fundamental level. Um, as we said, this is more of a pedagogical or a teaching exercise than it is um, you know, a real machine, although we did say the little man instruction set is capable of running, albeit not necessarily very uh, fast or with a whole lot of speed, um, any, you know, uh, computer program that you could run on any von Neumann machine, right? So in this abstraction, uh, memory rep was represented by mailboxes, right? Um, the buses in the, in the control unit um, is represented by the little man. Um, the ALU was our calculator, which we know is also um, going to be our ALU and also represented our general purpose registers. 
uh, program counter was uh, a register that is a special purpose register that keeps track of which line or which um, address memory, I should say, that your line of code is currently at. So as you go through a program, you would start at zero, zero. And every time you run a new line of code, the program counter would get incremented, right? And you would go to that next place in memory to grab the instruction. If you branched, we know that you change the program counter based upon the branch. So if the branch condition was true and the branch's operand in the man computer said to, you know, change the program counter to uh, 30, then you would change the program counter to 30. And on the next fetch, the little man would grab the instruction from mailbox 30, which is memory address 30 in a real machine. Um, IO interface, remember, was just in and out box for a little man computer, and that represents basically everything outside of this primary storage relationship of the CPU and memory, right? So when we look here, um, we have all of those components here, right? We have an ALU, we have an IO interface, which again is, is that inbox and outbox that's going out to the rest of the computer. We have the control unit, which is all the buses and circuitry and um, everything from decoding the instruction register to carrying out the actual objects, and obviously with the memory, which is the mailboxes as well, right? So we're going to be taking this abstraction, um, you know, using this high level abstraction of an actual machine, but now we're going to build that up and, and make it into a real thing, right? So uh, we're going to explore registers and ALU and memory, uh, but before we get to all this, let's first look at the very ground level, where we start. So we start with this thing called a transistor. A transistor is just a switch. It's quite literally a switch. Um, it's a switch that we can control, and it's the important part, that we can control electronically, and it has no physical movement. So before transistors, uh, there were things like vacuum tubes um, and you know relays. Now, vacuum tubes and relays um, actually perform the same task, but there was a couple of problems. One was they were inherently very slow. Um, you know, maybe not in uh, the grand scheme of things, you know, maybe they could actually perform hundreds or, or maybe more uh, operations per second. That might sound pretty fast, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, from where transistors are today, it's not. We know that our transistors can uh, perform billions of things per second, right? So this is uh, because it's a non-mechanical device. It doesn't physically move. There's no, um, you know, motion. There's no parts to wear out. Um, you know, or at least hypothetically, obviously, over time, uh, the, the silicon itself might degrade or something. But um, there's no moving parts here. So that that's the other piece of it. So it's it's very fast and it doesn't wear out. Um, one of the problems with really computers is that, you know, if you had vacuum tubes, if there was a statistical certainty that you were going to have so much downtime because the vacuum tubes were going to burn out. And in fact, they would, you know, have to build that in where they would keep track of the age of the vacuum tubes and they'd replace them every so often. Um, they even had, uh, you know, random problems occur, like uh, the, the kind of uh, traditional uh, accepted story behind a computer bug uh, was, I believe it was Grace Hopper and, and her team were, were working on a computer program and it might have been on an ENIAC, but I honestly don't remember. Um, but, you know, they, they actually had a problem in, the, in software and they're trying to debug it and uh, it turned out to be a moth uh, fried a, a vacuum tube and it actually burnt it out. So uh, they found a bug in the system. So, you know, that, that was the, the kind of problem before a transistor. A transistor solved all that because the transistor was this, um, you know, device that just, it's, it's a piece of uh, semiconductor, which we're going to talk about. Um, we can turn it on and off electronically um, and, and there's no moving parts. So it's very fast and it's very reliable. It can do these things billions of times a second um, and it can do it over and over and over and over and over again for years and years and years and years very reliably. So what we're looking at here in, in the, the symbol of the transistor at the top there is how we can uh, view it in an electrical schematic. And what we're looking at there is basically, if you look from the top down, uh, the top would say 
be a voltage that's applied to this circuit, and that would be constant. On the left-hand side, the, the part kind of sticking in from the, from the center, um, that represents the actual switching circuit. When you apply voltage to that circuit, then the voltage from the top is allowed to flow through the transistor and out the bottom. Uh, the bottom, then, is where you would read the state of the transistor. So before you applied uh, voltage to what's called the control wire, or that, that left center wire there, um, the, the state of the transistor would be off. There would be no voltage applied. Um, when you do apply voltage, then the state would be on. So that is the, the basic idea here. Now, how a transistor works, I have a supplemental video here, and I, I also have a link um, in the resources. Uh, please check this out. This gives a really good uh, overview. It's only about a five or six minute video. And for our purposes here, uh, it explains exactly what we need to know. Again, this you know could have probably you know whole courses on on um, the engineering side of this, but that's not uh, how deep we need to go. Um, but the basic idea is that the switch is made up of a semiconductor, right? And semiconductor just basically means that it's more conductive than an insulator, but it's not quite as conductive as a full conductor. Um, so what they do is they use a technique called doping um, to put different uh, elements into the semiconductor that give it different properties on how well it conducts electricity. Um, and there's this area called the depletion layer that's around um, the center of it. And basically they can use this area and, and, you know, to kind of block the flow of current across the semiconductor until they apply voltage to the control line, in which case then a thin layer across the top allows the voltage to pass through from one side of the transistor to the other. Uh, the video will do a much better job of explaining it uh, than I am probably, and you can watch that over and over again. Uh, but that's the basic idea, right? It's this idea of a switch. We can control it with an electrical uh, control, and it allows then um, us to perform logic, right? So it's no different from the switch on your wall or a switch anywhere else. Now, one thing that we've talked about uh, earlier in the semester was Moore's Law. And we said Moore's Law was this idea that every 18 to 24 months, the number of transistors on a chip can double. Um, not necessarily the speed, remember, but the number of transistors. What we decide to do with those transistors is up to us. And the reason why they're able to double is because we can make them smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, now, what's happening is we're reaching a point where you can count um, the number of atoms across the middle part of the transistor. Um, and what's happening is as you get down to say eight or 10 or however many atoms it is across there, the depletion layer I mentioned before gets really, really small to the point where um, eventually it's so they're close, there's not enough space in between the two sides that the current can actually uh, sneak across, so to speak. There's not enough insulation, so to speak, to prevent it from crossing even if the switch is off. So this is kind of the, the challenge, and there's uh, a bunch of things that are being done to try to circumvent this, that we're actually getting to this point where we've made the, uh, possibly made the transistor as small as it can be. Um, again, this is a little bit outside of the, the scope of the course, but Moore's Law is very important to us as software engineers, uh, because for a long time, software engineers could actually, um, you know, engineer software on uh, the predicted uh, speed of a computer when they were done, right? If it took them a year or two to make a piece of software, uh, we could bank that, you know, hey, well, computers now aren't really fast enough, but when I'm done in two years, yeah, they should be, right? Um, but if Moore's Law is slowing down, that, that might not be the case anymore. So it is important to us, even though this isn't um, a, you know, hardware engineering course. Um, but there are things now called uh, 3D transistors where they figured out how to basically take the, the middle layer and, and kind of uh, make it, I believe, as a 90 degree angle from, from uh, the two others. And this has been able to afford more insulation space. Now, all of these things, you know, are, are interesting stop gaps. Um, I don't know that they're uh, going to ultimately fix the problem.
Um, but it doesn't mean that there isn't a very good solution just out there waiting to be discovered or that, uh, you know, silicon maybe gets replaced as a substrate or who knows. Um, there's a lot of interesting articles here, so I, I do invite you to check those out. Um, they give a little bit more backstory on that. Uh, but for now, we're going to uh, leave that and we're going to, to kind of go forward from there. Um, so we have a transistor and now we need to do something with it, right? So all it is is a switch, right? It's on or off, kind of, uh, zero or one. So we can use these gates to, you know, perform actual operations. Like, uh, for example, like when we talked about one's complement, right? We said to change a uh, value to representation or vice versa, we could just invert the bits, right? So in order to invert the bits, we said that was not gate, right? Any zero would become a one, and any one would become a zero. Uh, so a not gate would be a perfect example of how we would want to implement that. It also happens to be our most basic gate um, that we can do. It actually only requires one transistor, so we're going to start there. Um, but other operations are also, you know, pretty obvious, right? We talk a lot in programming about AND and OR operations, uh, so we can use those for gates. And as you'll see, um, adding will also be another gate that goes to actually be many gates involved in ALU, but there's one primary gate uh, that's not here yet. We're going to talk about it because it's actually built up of other gates um, that allows us to add. So we'll take a look at that as well. Um, just a little bit of review on logic. Uh, if you have, you know, two inputs, A and B, um, our outputs based on the gates, right? So we all know that an AND is zero and zero uh, together is zero. In fact, the only thing that is a one for an AND gate is one and one, right? You need both inputs to be a one in order to get a one back out. Anytime you see an N in front of it, uh, that stands for a not whatever the gate is. So a NAND gate is a not AND gate. It's actually a AND gate with a um, not gate on the end of it. So it's the opposite of whatever the output is for the AND. Uh, or is, you know, uh, basically zero is and zero is, uh, zero or zero, I should say, is zero. Uh, anything else is a one, which means not or is the opposite, right? Not or is one and zeros. Uh, an XOR is a very interesting gate an XOR is basically an exclusive OR. So you uh, may or may not remember this one from a uh, previous course, uh, but XOR is basically just like an OR, a zero or zero is a zero, uh, but a one or a one is also a zero. Basically, you have to have exclusively only one input be a one. So a zero or a one is a one, a one or a zero is a one, um, but those are the only two ones, okay? It's not, um, the, the kind of difference there is the one or one is a zero. Uh, and then a exclusive not or, um, or X nor, is uh, the opposite, right? So zero or zero is one, one or one is one, and the exclusives flip to zeros. All right, so with that in mind, uh, let's look at our first one. So not gate, as I mentioned, is one transistor. Uh, the transistor, uh, again, I'm going to keep that format where we have voltage coming in from the top in the diagram. I mean, obviously, in real life, the transistor uh, can be oriented in, in any number of ways, but I'm going to try to keep that consistent while we're working at this level. Um, the VCC represents voltage in. The amount of the voltage is an important um, logic voltage. You know, can be 3.3 volt, can be 5 volt, can be less than that. Um, that's, that's not super important for here. Um, What's important here is to, to kind of note that instead of normally, I said on the, on the first slide where we were looking at transistors, that you would read from the bottom, right? So remember the top is the voltage in, the left uh, from the center there is your control wire, and then I said the bottom, uh, the lead out, is where you would read from. But on a knot, you actually read from uh, the voltage in. So what that means is that when you have voltage applied, which is all the time, um, you would think you would read out always one, right? But that's not actually the case. Because of the properties of uh, electricity, what happens is when you turn this gate on, the, the out lead 
is grounded out immediately. Um, so what happens is that electricity always takes the path of least resistance. And because there is a, a simpler path to follow, when you turn on the control wire, the, it does not follow the out lead. It actually goes straight through the switch and just grounds out. So when you turn on the control wire, the out actually becomes a zero. And when you turn off the control wire, then the out is a one because it can't get to the ground. So the new path of least resistance is actually to follow that out there that's going off to the right. So a NOT gate is simply a single transistor. We're just reading it from the input uh, side instead of the output side. Uh, so it's a little bit of a, of a trickery there. An AND gate uh, is two now, it's two transistors, and we're going to wire them in a series. So uh, one is actually wired from the other. So you have your voltage going into um, transistor one there, and you have an A control wire on that one. If you turn the A control wire on, meaning I supply voltage to that, its value is a one, then the voltage will go through transistor one. This is a standard transistor, not like the, the not one from before. We don't have an out lead on the top. Um, so the out comes out the bottom and into uh, the input of transistor two. So transistor two isn't actually receiving voltage unless transistor one um, actually uh, is on, right? Now transistor two has to also be on for the voltage to come out uh, from the other side, right? So both A and B have to be one. And if that's true, then the electricity uh, does make it through uh, all the way. And there's a reading on the um, end there where it actually reads the value of transistor two, right? So that's an AND gate. This is wired in a series and both A and B must be on in order for the AND gate to be complete. An OR gate is two transistors, just like before. However, instead of wiring them in a series, we're going to wire them in parallel. So that means that the voltage is supplied to the inputs of both transistor one and transistor two at the same time. And uh, also the outputs of transistor one and transistor two are also tied together in such a way that only one of these transistors has to be on in order to complete the circuit, right? So um, remember if, uh, way back and near the beginning of the semester when we did, um, I think it was our second lab, we did the hardware lights and you had two switches and one was in series and one was in parallel. And when you wired the one in series, you had to hold down both buttons to get the light to come on. And when you wired the one in parallel, you only had to hold down one or the other, right? So what you actually did was wire uh, both an AND gate uh, for the series and an OR gate for parallel, right? So it's the same exact idea here. Uh, if either A or B is on in this scenario for OR, then you will produce an output of one. Uh, it only requires one. And if they're both on, that's okay too. You still get an output of one, right? But if neither one is on, then you get an output of zero. All right, so believe it or not, those are our basic gates um, because and the reason why we, we start with that abstraction layer is now because we can take those three basic gates and we can combine those to make additional gates. So I just wanna point out for a moment that we're gonna go through abstraction pretty quick here. We started with a transistor, right? So there's the transistor, that's the abstraction of the transistor and we said that's kind of like where our course starts. We don't go beyond that. Then we said, okay, well, we can take that transistor and we can use it to create different logic gates. So a NOT gate only required one, an AND gate required two, an OR gate required two, and the abstractions now for AND, OR, and NOT are what we're going to use to build more complex gates, like XOR, which is a very important gate to us. So let's look at that. So this is an XOR gate, and it consists of a NAND gate, an AND gate, and an OR gate, right? So we could also say two AND gates, a NOT, and an OR, but um, it's a little bit easier to, to say NAND. So if you look at how this is laid out, there's still two inputs, right? So two XOR, there are two inputs. So uh, you can say this is input A, right? And this is input B, and this is the output. Uh, so here's A in this first example, and here's B. 
each one of these is uh, how it would play out for A and B in every combination. So here we have 0, 0, here we have 0, 1. Um, sorry, this should be 1, 0. Uh, that's an edit uh, failure on my part, and 1, 1. So uh, this now, if we, we follow this through, we have a 0 and a 0. Uh, so we can see exactly what the output of each gate will be and how this will play out. So with A being 0, it's fed into the A input of this NAND and it's fed into uh, the A input of this OR. Uh, B is also fed into this, the second input of each, right? So this NAND gets a zero and a zero, and the AND part of it produces a zero, but the NOT part of the NAND produces a one, right? So we actually get a one out there. Uh, the OR gets two zeros, so an OR is zero, zero is a zero, so that gets produced out, and then this AND at the end gets a one and a zero, which equates to a zero, right? Now, if we have, say, one of these two be a one, so in this case it's the B input, uh, in this case we flip this gate, right? Because this AND got a zero and a one, uh, so just like before, it produces a zero, and the, the not here flips it as a one. Um, however, what's different now is this OR, right? Before we had two zeros fed to this OR, which meant it fed out a zero, but now one of them is a one, so it feeds out a one. So at this point, both inputs to the AND gate are one, and it produces a one, so that means that our XOR would have produced a one. So this would be a one where this is a zero, which falls in line with what we would expect from an XOR. Uh, again, this one I should have reversed the inputs here. This A should be a 1 and B should be a 0. Uh, but the results are the same, right? So the results of this is that, um, you know, we still have a different lead on this OR gate as a 1, but we still have one of them being a 1, at least, which means that the output is a 1. Uh, because this one had um, an output of a 0, which would be served by anything other than a one and a one coming in here, which we haven't seen yet, then its output is a one. So this and is happy and we get a one. Now, let's look at the important one. This is what's different about an XOR. So when we feed in both a one and a one, now we get a one here and a one here and a one here and a here, this and gate produces a one. This is what's different now from everything else. Um, but because it produces a one, it's an and, so this not part of it changes it to a zero, which means that we send the zero over here, and it actually doesn't matter what happens down here. This zero means this AND gate will never produce anything other than a zero, so we get a zero. Uh, so this is an example of how we can create an XOR gate based upon uh, really four other gates, right? I guess you could call it three if you call it the NAND instead of the AND and the NOT, but, um, you know, so in, in it just kind of coming back to how this abstraction works, I'm not going to break this anymore after this, but if you think in transistors, right, how many transistors are in each of these? Well, let's take a look. We know that uh, this not part has one transistor. We know that an AND has two, an OR has two, and an AND has two. So right there we have two, four, six, and seven transistors, right? So every XOR uh, gate is comprised of seven transistors, right? So we're going to keep coming, building these layers of abstraction. In fact, an XOR gate is an important part of our next layer of abstraction that we're going to come to after this. So I'll come back around to that in a moment. Um, so we went through this. This is just a, another review of our, our Boolean logic. I wanted to, uh, now that we know what they are, put the symbols for the gates up here. So you have AND, uh, NAND, OR, uh, NOR, uh, XOR, and XNOR. Right? So those are now with the abstractions here that you're going to see going forward uh, for these gates.